Hi, my name is Alexandra and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt where we read better, not more. Today we are finishing up our discussion of the Odyssey in this, our fourth episode on the book. Previously we have compared the Iliad and the Odyssey, we have examined the Greek concepts of the Oikos and the Homosophrone, we have analyzed Odysseus's flaw as well as the suitor's wrongs, and you can find all of that information in the playlist which I will link above and below. However, today we will be taking a look at the Underworld. So the Odyssey sets the standard. A journey to the underworld from this point out in literary tradition becomes a key point in epic poetry. The pit stop is first visited by Aeneas. It is the whole experience of Dante's Inferno, and it is certainly examined in Milton's Paradise Lost. In the magical and mythical world of the Odyssey, a world filled with cyclopses, lotus eaters, kings, seemingly mortal men who are given responsibility over the wind, it is only the underworld that seems otherworldly. That is to say that any person can sail past the Sirens Island or past Scylla and Charybdis. They are part of the natural landscape. It is only the underworld that has special rules to access it. It is only the underworld that seems to exist in a metaphysical plane. Actually, many of the characters seem more magical in this story compared to the Iliad. Hermes has a magical staff, elsewhere he's just simply godlike. Athena has a wand and is practically like a fairy godmother in this tale, but most mystical of all is Circe, the witch, the user of pharmacy. And if you're interested in more on that, I do have a discussion on the novel Circe by Madeline Miller as well on my channel, so I'll link that for you. It's perfectly suiting that Circe, who has tamed lions and wolves, who bends the natural world by her arts, is the person through whom the arcane knowledge of crossing the barrier to the underworld comes. So let's take a look at how you do it according to the Odyssey. So first of all, the north wind will carry you to the grove of Persephone, black poplars and willows, by the way. You're gonna find the junction of two rivers. Dig a pit, a cubit wide, a cubit deep, a cubit long. One cubit is about a foot and a half. Make drink offerings to the dead. First, honey mixed with milk, then wine, then water, then sprinkle it with white barley on top. From there, you promise to sacrifice your best cow and a black ram once you get back to Ithaca, and then actually sacrifice a ram that you have with you and a black female sheep that you have with you. Then all of the get dead will gather around to, they want to drink the offerings that you've sort of gathered in this pit. And don't let any of them drink of it until you get the person that you actually want to talk to first, and that's Tiresias, because otherwise you can't guarantee that you'll get to talk to that person. The reason why you want to talk to Tiresias is because he's still a prophet even in the afterlife, and he's going to tell Odysseus how to succeed, what his outcome is going to be. But before Tiresias shows up, he sees Elpinor, who's one of his company. It turns out that he died the previous night by falling off of Circe's roof. And again, I'm not sure if this is supposed to be a bit of a comedic moment to lighten the mood, but either way, it's a bit of an interesting interlude. Then his mother, who he didn't know was dead, uh, comes up. And then finally Tiresias comes. So this is sort of like this powerful temptation because of course he's going to want to talk to his mom, but he has to wait because Tiresias hasn't shown up yet. So he holds his mom back from holding, from drinking, and then Tiresias does drink the offerings. And Tiresias explains all the hardships that Odysseus has yet to face, but that he probably will get home. He may come home. Here again, it makes he makes it clear that self-control is the central problem. He says, but even so and still you might come back after much suffering if you can contain your own desire and your companions' desire, in parentheses. Um, so again, Tiresias lays out a plan of return for Odysseus, and here the emphasis on killing the suitors is more about Odysseus asserting his right to rule than their violation of hospitality. Also, Tiresias explains how Odysseus must propitiate Poseidon. That scene is never actually included in the Odyssey. Like, it, we never find out if Odysseus goes and does that, which is a bit interesting. So after Odysseus gets the prophecies from Tiresias, he is then able to sort of like open it up so that other people can drink of the offerings and he can talk with them. So let's through, run through those souls that he talks to really quickly. 
So first is his mother, whom he tries to embrace three times before he figures out that she's incorporeal. She explains the situation at home with Penelope, with Telemachus, and with his father, who are still living, at least as it was when she died. Then we get a series of wives and daughters of princes. That's sort of the category of people that we see. The first three had sons by Zeus. The fourth is Oedipus's wife slash mother. The fifth is Nestor's mother. Then we have Leta, famous for the story of Leta and the Swan. Again, another woman who had children by Zeus. And then one who had sons by Poseidon. So you get the theme here. We get gods, they're baby making with some princesses. And I'm not exactly sure why this section is included. Let me know what your thoughts might be. What is, what is the purpose for this? What is the story trying to communicate? I don't know. Agamemnon then comes up and he tells the story of how he died, warning him not to trust his wife, warning him to come in secretly so he's not attacked. And then we have Achilles and he says that he would have rather lived as a bond servant farming another man's land than have died in battle and gotten the glory that he has. So here we have another answer given for the question that plagued Achilles in the Iliad. Glory in battle is not worth it. And then Achilles asked about, asks about his son Neoptolemus and Odysseus shares the latest that he knows, which is basically, I last saw him at Troy and he was a really great fighter and tells some stories about that. Next comes Ajax, who will not talk to Odysseus because he's mad that Odysseus won the arms of Achilles after Achilles' death. So this would be the, arm, the second set of armor of, at Hephaestus' death. I'm sorry, that Hephaestus made for Achilles. Uh, and I'm a little bit confused because I don't remember that happening in the Iliad, and I think that's like some traditions might contradict that. Anyway, then there's some other less important souls, and then the last person is Heracles, or Hercules, who warns Odysseus not to become the plaything of the gods, essentially. He basically regets his life of many heroic labors because he says, like, Zeus put all of this thing before me, before me, and I was basically just his slave going about accomplishing all of these great things, and it was pointless. So one observation that I have about like this second set of heroes that we talk to after the princesses, which I have no idea what that's about, one observation of this section is that the mortals in death are unchanging. The state of mind they died in, they preserve in death. Agamemnon distrusts his wife forever in the afterlife. Achilles is still tragic forever in the afterlife. Ajax is still angry over a small argument forever in the afterlife. And this is in contradiction to the ever-living gods who are constantly changeable. And so that's one look at sort of this idea of what is our fate after life to be the same as we ever were. And so Odysseus leaves the underworld and Tiresias' prophecies do come true as we have discussed in the previous, in previous episodes about the end. So what do you think about Achilles' conclusion about life now that we visit him in the afterlife? What about the most famous hero of all, Hercules? He seems to agree with him. They definitely take this sort of tragic view of life. And that's what I have for you today. And that's our last episode on the Odyssey. Until next time, I'm Alexandra and I'm still a bibliophile. <laughs>